Welcome. My name is Dr. George Machaki, and this session, uh, session three, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, introducing you to global business. This is part of a series or uh, courses you're taking me either online, face to face, or in a hybrid section, or in uh, one of my websites on uh, internet uh, on uh, introduction to business or business organizations. Okay, so let's get starting with uh, entering the global market. The biggest issues with entering the global market more of the larger multinational organizations are already in the global market. What the government and what we need for the economy to be fruitful and expanding uh, uh, growth, for lack of better words, to improve our gross domestic product is to expand into international global market. Not importing. Sometimes importing is good when I'm importing stuff, my supplies because I get it uh, at a lower cost as a small business to medium business, but also exporting. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, a lot of my research and my doctoral studies were basically an international business. And the biggest drawback that I see with the United States is that more uh, most of our small businesses that are trained by community colleges do not focus as much as international business, but try to uh, help the economy within their local jurisdiction. That is a good philosophy, but we're in a flat world, flat economic system. We can only sell so much in our local areas. We can only sell so much within our uh, borders, for lack of better words, within the United States. And if we're experiencing a recession or a depression or uh, we're coming out, who has the money or the capital to buy? It could be China. It could be India. And a lot of companies, also China, India, they're big. They have a lot of uh, uh, companies there, but they may not have the technology or the specific know-how that we have. So a community college has to foster the idea of when you open up, not only do you have to think locally, but you have to think globally, how I can sell my market. So let's go on here. Why should we trade? And this is just a good introduction to this course. And remember, you, you always will have my concept maps. I'm going to bring it out over here. Let me just view this a little bit, make this a little bit uh, uh, larger. Uh, one second here. Sorry, uh, at least go 200. Okay, there we go. Now, free trade. When I look at free trade, buy or sell. Just like a company, a, a, a country could make as much as they can, but sometimes it's to their advantage to buy outside the organ, uh, outside the company uh, or the country, because I could get it at a better uh, price, and then the, uh, make what I do best within my uh, uh, boundaries. Okay, natural resources, like I said, beneficial exchange. We may have uh, natural resources. If I'm looking at what's happening in the U.S. now, the gasoline prices are going on. Sure, there's a lot of unrest in the Middle East and everything else, but because we are fracking and we're now becoming a big player in providing crude oil, and we provide it not only for us as a, one of our larger markets, which uh, we're not as dependent on other uh, uh, countries in Middle East or uh, yeah, yeah, or even like uh, Brazil or uh, uh, some Latin American countries that also have a good oil reserve, we could produce it ourselves and now we're bringing more. Remember, as long as there's more suppliers in a free market, even a global economy, that's what keeps the cost down. When there's only a few suppliers and scarce resources, then the prices uh, uh, tend to escalate. The supply and demand that we learned in chapter or a couple of uh, uh, sessions before on uh, economics. Okay, six billion potential customers, 193 countries we could serve, 75 percent in developing countries. Developing countries means right now, if I could get into the uh, the country as they're developing, the economy's developing. As they develop, they're going to want more the high end. They're have a higher uh, disposable income. Right now they're just doing more for survival, but even like in China, you figure if I'm looking uh, at their economy, the people at the beginning just wanted basic needs. Now they want a TV. Now they want a car. And be, as the economy, uh, as the culture, as the, the development, the, the economy develops and it goes higher and higher and people get higher wages and get more benefits and they want more stuff for lack of better words and I could be able to supply the small 
or a medium-sized business. The multinationals are already doing it. I'm trying to get more to small and medium-sized businesses, especially in the United States, uh, because uh, we represent 80% of the e-commerce or the commerce within a, uh, within a country, but only represent 20% of uh, uh, the money coming into our uh, gross domestic product. Okay, So small business. What do we consider small business? Uh, may uh, be a key to global uh, growth, only 30% of small business export to 70%. Why aren't we exporting? Remember, small business comes to community colleges or come to a, a, a consultant, and we have to not only get them profitable within their economic or boundaries that they're uh, located, but we have to have you start thinking at when we're training them, when we're teaching them, when we're educating them, to start thinking international. The European Union, now that they're coming up together, each one of those countries were like a state of the United States, uh, similar, uh, if I want to look at something that uh, you could look at, you know, Illinois could have been its own country at one time. And so we became the United Federation of the United States. Same thing with the European Union, when it became a federation. So they already know how to do global, because they had to do it between each other uh, was markets. Now that they're one uh, economic factor, like the uh, like we're going to be talking about the NAFTA, which brings in uh, uh, Mexico and Canada to uh, with free trade. I'm not talking about uh, migrations or immigrant. Uh, I mean, uh, or people. I'm just talking about goods coming back and uh, back and forth without any kind of borders. That expands our market for not only labor or expenses, but also selling and buying. So we're already kind of used to it. So if, if a small business wants to open up, they, look, they go to the European Union, similar, they speak English, they, hear, they do our currency, or you could go to Mexico or Canada, because we at least already have a lot of our businesses since we have a high Mexican populations or, 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 or uh, Latino populations in the United States. We already know how to sell and communicate with them. We have a good, uh, familiar background and how to uh, market and basically uh, build relationships with small businesses of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, the, the South American or, uh, or Latin American uh, uh, countries, including Mexico. Okay, let's see advantages. Comparative advantage. When looking at businesses, we basically, what do we specialize? We specialize in software. But, you know, so we have an alliance with China and India, but China is picking up on a lot of software knowledge and, uh, and ability. They know how to develop and everything else. Where we still have the edge, we come up with creativity. Our creativity is one of our strengths. And the reason we're creative is because we have people from all different countries looking at the same problem or solution to a problem or a, a, a new product or anything else from different perspectives. That is how you get creativity, not just one way of thinking that we got 20 ways of thinking. But to harness that creativity is the strength of the United States. Even though I'm, uh, I may be Jewish and I may be, uh, 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 what do you call it, Muslim uh, uh, or, or from a Middle Eastern, we may not get along there, but for some reason they seem to get along in the United States because the structure is different. We don't have that anxiety or we try not to. I'm not saying we're perfect. There's no country that's perfect. But at least we're trying, you know, here it's, it's okay. We try to, uh, our laws and our policies try to bring that harmony as best as we can, okay, right? So anyway, so uh, 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 that's our, what are our advantages. I think more of a uh, uh, creativity. Now, the only thing we have creativity of advantage, but if we don't turn around right away, we don't invest in it. So other countries will buy our creativity and they'll do the manufacturing and uh, uh, exporting. But we should do some of it, okay? Even if we just sell the patents on that. Absolute advantages. What do we have that one country has that no other countries had before? The Middle East used to be, you know, when you look at OPEC, had the power of the oil reserves. It's a resource. Now that the U.S. is doing fracking and everything else, their power is beginning to shift a little bit. So there's another player coming in. So now, if you look at the prices going down, but eventually, remember, it's a resources that is non-renewable. Unless we get with solar energy or nuclear power, there's a renewable types of uh, 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 of an energy, uh, we're going to be in the same boat. That's why you're going to use it, uh, utilize it all up. Remember not Adam Smith, but Thomas Mattis, the dismal science of economics. There's only so much resources. After those resources, and you have more people eat up all the resources, what's going to happen? The resources are scarce, so you have to minimize on the population. That's the, but, you know, we're looking at Adam Smith. The, uh, we have an unlimited resources because we go to different countries that aren't utilizing their resources because they may not need it as much. Where one has another, so we're bartering and trading. But eventually, since we're a flat organization internationally, when you're looking at it, we may end up back to the Thomas Mattis uh, scenario unless we find substitutes. 
And I'm not uh, trying to solve modified foods or anything else, but if you look at solar energy, another source of energy that is renewable, okay? Okay, so uh, exporting, importing, I'm not going to talk too much in that. You know, exporting, you bring goods uh, out. Uh, uh, importing, uh, I'm selling goods uh, um, to other countries, okay? Measure global trade, balance of trade. is. It's looking at the, uh, how much do we export and how much do we import. When I look at trade surplus, that means I'm basically imp uh, uh, importing, uh, 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 exporting more than I'm importing. So if I'm importing stuff in, that means I'm bringing somebody else goods. I had that turned around uh, the other way up there. It's exporting, I'm selling goods to somebody else, importing, I'm bringing goods in. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is basically uh, 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 export more and import less, okay? So when I have a trade deficit, where we have a trade def deficit, we're basically uh, importing more than we're exporting. And in some countries, it's just that the U.S. Uh, doesn't uh, adjust well to different cultures. And in other cultures, you know, we want to sell right away without relationship. A lot of uh, cultures outside the United States, when we look at uh, at Halstein, it was an IBM uh, researcher that basically looked at uh, 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 a hundred different countries that the IBM was working with and try to find a common denominator for different individuals. And some individuals, when I look at uh, uh, you know, the culture, is more of a relationship where we're more individualistic. So some of our cultures, we do well with individualistic cultures, but we don't adapt well to relationship cultures. In a, in a nutshell, uh, they won't buy from us unless they have a relationship. They trust us. They say, I like working with you. And then we'll see what your product. Where we don't care. I mean, we do in the U.S. We're, we're more of a, let's look at your product. Your product good. Okay, you got a lower cost. Uh, I mean, not like dealing with you, but you get the lower cost. I'll do business with you. Flip side when you're doing it in the global. So remember, the culture has a big uh, impact in that. Okay, so we got the balance of payments. We had the balance and favorable, and they both look like they both tie into. Uh, 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 more money f flowing in and out, and that has a big uh, impact on your imports and your exports, okay? And remember, if you ever look at how much we owe, we're one of the biggest debtor nations in the world. We owe everybody, and, but, but we do buy a lot, and we do keep the economy going, but at a price. Eventually, people want the money back. And, and, and as you look at uh, our gross domestic products uh, uh, globally, we're still, for all the money and taxes and everything else we owe, we're, uh, uh, we're still making 20%. We still have money out there, what we would call disposable uh, um, a currency that the U.S. has that they, we can still buy products and stuff and still pay our debts. Uh, we're not, uh, if you look at some countries, Greece, where they're defaulting under uh, loans, it's because they have a, a more uh, a debt than they have money coming in. It's like I got a job and I'm only making $100. Uh, let's, say, let's say I'm making, okay, I'll we'll do it generally. Let's say I'm making uh, $1,000 a month and I've got bills of uh, 15, uh, you know, 1500 a month. So I can never catch up because I'm always, uh, I owe more than I ever bring in unless I have have um, uh, extra cash. Right now we have $800 of, uh, of debt and we got like uh, $200 still of uh, spending money. But we got to watch it because as the debt and interest in re go, uh, goes up, uh, that disposable income that a currency has will be uh, 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 dwindled away. Okay, so then if we, our currency is not worth anything, we try to go for assets. What could we sell? Okay, unfair trade practice. If we look at dumping, the dumping is basically a real simple philosophy. The government is subsidizing a, 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 a country within and it goes on the free market and the global market, and other countries can't because uh, their government does not subsidize that country, they can't compete with it. If they can't compete with it, eventually we go that country's. Uh, 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 industry that can't that is not subsidizing and the other countries dumping their product because that their host country is subsidizing their uh, 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 company's uh, uh, product we go out of business and now they're the only uh, uh, seller uh, or selling their product within that uh, country and you could raise the prices anything else because we can't compete with them uh, so what happens uh, is illegal, and that's when we have a protective tariff that we'll be talking around. There's two types of tariffs. I'll just swing over there while we're already here. There's two types of tariffs that we have to look at. Uh, the, the, the trade agreements. Uh, uh, I'll get into that in, in a little uh, a second on here, okay? So uh, I think I have it in here. Forces, merchandising. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, you have two types of tariffs, and one is basically... Um, uh, a revenue tariff and the other one is a protective. The protective tariff is the one you're looking at to protect the unfair uh, business practice. Okay, so let's go in here. Strategies to enter. The easiest answer is a license agreement. If I look at license agreement, I, just sell, I still sell my product, just give them the rights. Okay, 
easiest, you know, manufacturers for a fee, gaining revenue to produce products and uh, 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 produce or market products in their host country. The problem with licensing agreement is they may have my formula. After a while, they could do copycats, and I, unless I'm looking at the country's economic, social, and judicial uh, structure, will I be protected if someone is taking my product and making a whole bunch of copy and I'm not getting my royalty in there. And that's what a lot of companies. China is uh, used to be uh, bad at that. They're cracking down on that because people won't do business with them. Why would I want to, to do business and sell my products? Even though they would like to do it on their own, but they're still to bring the economy. Remember, when you're looking at this comparative and advantage and the balance of trade, a lot of countries are going, hey, we're buying, uh, you're buying, uh, we're buying a lot of your products. You should buy some of my bag. Otherwise, heck, I'm not going to buy from you. And countries will do that by actually adding more protective tariffs on all goods coming in. And that takes away from the free market, not only from a country, but from a global perspective. Okay, the next one says franchising. Remember when we learned from franchising, and those of you can't remember, or I'll do a real quick overview. From franchising, when I'm the franchisor, I have an idea, you pay me a royalty. Now, you want to open up a franchisee in another country, and I'm saying I don't want to try it. I said, I'll give you a license agreement or a royalty. You could open up there. All the risk is on you as a franchisee. You get the land, you get everything else. The only thing you do, you could use my name, my product, and everything else, and I back behind it that you're uh, creating your product exactly to my recommendations with some uh, modifications depending on the country or the host country you're working with. Real quick in a nutshell. So you're taking all the risk. You pay me this, and now that business is doing well. The franchisee gets all the risk in, the, uh, uh, in let's say, in Africa or some other country that McDonald's may not want to go into. I just showed that at Burger King, Wendy's. Uh, you know, I'm looking at the fast foods. I, I like all three of them. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, White Castle. Uh, throw them all in, okay? What's happening in there is now they'll open up another one. So that franchisee says, I'll open up. So you got two or three. Now the corporate franchise is looking and says, hey, now we could also open up, not in their area, because remember, in the franchise agreement, you have a, a, an area that you could uh, operate without another franchisee coming in there, and now the corporation will open up and take the risk. But the franchisee does all the work. You know, multinational organization, I'll go real quickly, they're companies that they look at the world as their whole playing field, okay? Joint ventures, how do I get into a joint venture partnership? Sometimes if I want to go into like France or Germany, or something else, they're very loyal to their corporations within their country because they know it supplies job and economic growth within the, uh, within the country. But if I do a joint agreement with them and sell my American card, my Chevy with Lexus or something else, I have a better way of getting in because they already have the distribution system. They already got the name recognition. They already got the loyalty. And now they see that this company has some kind of... Uh, partnership with it. They're hiring Germans and working there and selling. So uh, it's not exactly 100% German, but it's close enough where the, uh, I could get my foot in and maybe down the road I could spin off on myself if I want. A lot of companies don't do that because they got the agreement on there. Subsidiaries, you know, are owned by a parent company but located in different uh, 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 countries. Foreign direct uh, investment, that's the, most, uh, that's the biggest one. That's when you have like Toyota, uh, Nissan Auto Assembly plant open up in Tennessee. Now they don't have to worry about any kind of tariffs. They don't have to worry about anything else. They could say, hey, we're creating American jobs because uh, American workers are doing it. We're using American product. Even though a lot of stuff is shipped in here, but it's assembled in the U.S. so that could be an American-made car. By the rules, Whatever or whatever the rules uh, are. The bottom line, you don't have to worry about tariffs or any kind of protective tariffs or any kind of revenue tariffs because they're already building here in the U.S. But you have to worry about the about the laws and everything else here in the United States. And contract manufacturing, I just contract my product out and they bring it back in. You see, like Nike shoes, or uh, and I just use that as an example. There's some of the other ones basically just contract out and they build, uh, uh, make it here to their specifications. But the labor is cheaper on this, and different alliances with uh, 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 similar industries just to get my foot in there. Okay. I have that, uh, uh, how uh, getting trade, you have export assistance, small business association, trade centers, and they will basically help small businesses on a scale. Remember, the government would rather give you grant money, help you to get going, to do it, not for him. 
importing. We import too much for exporting products to offset the balance of payment. The more you could get small businesses involved in exporting, and uh, uh, right outside, and then importing a little. But sometimes you have to import because you get your products and everything uh, at a lower price. You're a small business owner. You're trying to look at your margin is smaller and your risks are higher, and you don't have that much of a room for any kind of an error. You have to know your customer base. You have to be very aware of that. But that's how you're going to make money. Or once you're even buying from them down the road, you could have a relationship. You could be selling to them. Okay? Reverse back. Controlled by the government. Sovereign about to certain goods or something else that the government says, we got so much oil. You know, the United States has a lot of property or land that's owned by what they call by the uh, agricultural it's, you know, or the forestry. And you can't build on it. But they could sell certain sections for like fracking or they could sell something for the timber because it's a need or, or, or to, uh, something else here. So they own that. So when they, uh, uh, instead of paying cash, you say, hey, we'll give you access to build whatever everything you build, 80% you can take back to your host country or, or whatever. The rationale is to help the economy of that country, but the government, remember, the constituents, all the citizens, that money should help other people out there. So even though the, 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 they're selling this asset, that's the asset of everyone that belongs in that country because we're citizens of that country, we should be able to get some kind of offset, either helping us with global or increasing our uh, quality of life, or as in my case, my student loans I'd like to get paid off, that would help me out if the government says, hey look, like a lot of countries will, uh, global countries, where we can't compete as well because it's a socialist or part socialist, but they pay for all the education and you have to stay in that country for five, ten years, and now you're helping the economy and you're helping everything else because you've got the knowledge and everything else. We don't look at it that way. We try to tax everybody and everything else instead of helping it. Or if they're doing something else, you could say, hey, instead of student loans, if you open up a small business and you hire so many employees, that's another way to get people more involved in the small business. That's just me talking, out, uh, right, trying to find a way, okay? to pay off my student loan. Your know, forces affecting us, you've got the social culture, remember, it's a different religion, language, values, uh, everything else. In the United States, we like to put the American flag and everything else because of patriotic. We try to do the same thing in a global country. I was going to sell in Saudi Arabia or, or, or you know, in a Middle Eastern country. And we, uh, but what happens is when we take the, uh, a lot of their flags have the Quran. So if you put on a paper cup and throw it under, it's disrespectful to the Quran, to the religion. So when I'm looking at that, did not work well, and it also showed that uh, it could have came across like American arrogance, but that's, that wasn't the case. It probably more of Americans. Uh, okay, it could be insensitive, or basically just a lack of knowledge, or uh, uh, I want to say like stupidity, for lack of better words. But we're doing better. We're understanding different cultures. You know, we're learning like anything else. Because we used to be everything. We were the center. Now we're not the center anymore. We're part of. Uh, a global community, so we should know how to deal uh, with other countries, with other uh, uh, languages, with other uh, individuals. You know, the same thing when I look at the economic and financial exchange rate, how much is my dollar worth against the ruble, how much is my dollar worth against the yen, uh, uh, you know, for in Japan or the yen, uh, uh, for China, vice versa, I get the two mixed up. Or, you know, counter training, if their currency is worth, uh, uh, worthless, Venezuela right now, they got high inflation, we just want their oil, what's the equivalent to the oil, in, uh, forget the, uh, the pesos or the currencies, we just uh, will take the oil in, in, instead. You know, and the devaluation is, you know, our currency is uh, not as strong or is devaluated uh, uh, by the global, you know, the monetary uh, IMF, International Monetary Fund, that looks at uh, the, the global uh, uh, exchange in, in currencies rate. You know, trade protections, you know, protective, uh, like I mentioned with, uh, earlier for the steel industry, because we can't compete with it. And that cannot be with dumping. We just may not compete with it, but we want to keep that industry alive. Or revenue, because we can, okay? And then embargo. I think we have a few countries. you got right now, you got Russia, we got an embargo. You know, Cuba, we got an embargo. And, you know, there's a debate. Should we take that uh, embargo off? Look, I, as a business owner, I don't get involved in the politics, but the politics I have to be aware of because it does affect my bottom line, affects what I can do business with a con uh, country. Uh, if I look at McDonald's, some country to Russia, you know, we're having a little bit uh, uh, we're having an embargo issue so what could I sell they're getting mad at us if we can't sell our products I can't buy my product I'm not going to find another supplier or, or I got to find another person to buy my product so you know uh, 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 when the governments are fighting it affects the small business but we should have a contingency plans 
okay, uh, you know, uh, quotas and global e-commerce. What about with global e-commerce is, uh, you know, with the exchange rate and everything else when you're looking at is MasterCard, Visa, the exchange. And, you know, because when I'm buying something in France and when I'm buying it by the pounds and when I'm buying something in India with a ruby or a ruble uh, uh, from Russia, it's irrelevant. The minute that the transaction happens, uh, MasterCard or the banking system for the global banking system, for lack of better words, is Master's Charge or Visa is a global financial institution all over the world uh, 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 transferring uh, money back and forth. At that time, they send the goods, depending on the country, the host countries, their uh, rules and regulations. But normally, basically, when they send the goods and they charge my credit card or my debit card, at that time, they're looking at what the cost is in that country. They do the exchange rate, and here's how much this is equivalent to the uh, into the U.S. Uh, amount. Okay, now legal concerns. When I'm looking at legal concerns, there's no global systems of laws. They're working on that. You're looking at the tax system. Those are when you're going to do some taxing, accounting down, uh, another session in, in this uh, series that I'm doing. But if you're doing accounting, they're looking at standard accounting practices so businesses know, hey, I got to, here's the county rules here, but in the U.K. it's not acceptable. In Russia, I can't do that. In China, this is not allowed. So they want a, a global accounting template so countries that are doing multinational and lot smaller larger to make it easier for us okay and then yeah you know, i know when you look at legal concerns you know corruption bribery is in every country all right so when you're looking at legal concerns what are the rules of that whole country environmental issues again you know transportation uh, uh uh burning uh different types of coals right now in the united states uh, uh there's a i want to say a crackdown but there's a a big force to stop that uh, uh carbon uh uh, emissions from uh, coal plants, even though there is some, but you know, there's a lot of containment already done. But so coal isn't going here. Or you don't see any more coal plants coming up. The nuclear has a new uh, breath of life coming in there, solar panels and other uh, 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 means. But you got to be careful with the solar panels. I'm an, I'm an optimist. I think the sun is a great source. But if you have a volcano or if you have some kind of uh, uh, ash or something going on there, the solar panels, the sunlight's not going to come in. The solar panels are, uh, are not working very uh, adequately because of the dust and environment that could happen. So you're looking at that. But in, in a nutshell, coal is coming around with gasification that will basically make it purer and cleaner. But right now it's not there. So what do you do? So people from coal, I can't sell it here. China's a big coal importer. Even though they have a lot of coal, but if I could still sell it to them cheaper than what they could extract it from the ground, even with me shipping in there, that's where I would do it. Just like we do with our oil and everything else. If it was still cheaper outside the U.S., uh, 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 we would buy it. But once uh, the prices went up higher, fracking became a good alternative. And now, and as their prices, uh, oil, uh, natural oil went up, fracking prices were uh, uh, consistent. And so fracking became the, uh, the cost uh, what I call e, uh, equation or, or the cause um, uh, uh, sword for lack of better words that basically uh, uh, changed the course or brought the course down the, the, the cost down okay and then the trade agreement if I'm looking at trade agreements now here's what I look at uh, if I look at Gantt the last one general agreements on tariff and uh, uh, trade and you know it's a global trade okay so you got Gantt you got world trade agreements it's global mediation if I don't agree with one or other country we do some kind of agree, uh, uh, agreement you know there's a court system a global court says US you got to pay doesn't mean that, you know the, the, the only problem is they can't force me to pay but a lot of companies the the, the gentlemen's or the gentlewoman's uh, uh, honor system and if you look at NAFTA NAFTA is American free trade agreement between Canada Mexico and the US create more jobs uh, in the US but they also created more jobs in, uh, in Mexico you know it's got limited protection labor against laws response uh, it did all right it wasn't the best remember NAFTA was basically set up to offset by uh, President uh, uh, William Car uh, I mean uh, what do you call it uh, 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 Clinton is to offset the European Union because they figure once the East combined with the West, it was cheap and expensive labor, so Mexico was our cheap and expensive labor, so we could be competitive. But what happened is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, so uh, 
what, what happened and ended up, they forgot about China coming in. China came in later on, and they're basically saying, you may see NAFTA and European labor together. Now, the other one, you're looking at the common market. So I'm looking at the common markets. You know, so if I'm looking at the European Union, European Union kind of started off like the United States. Uh, they had 13 colonies. That's how we started off. And so they had 13 original countries, and they brought more countries in. So they have a federation, so they're no longer common, but they have a global uh, uh, aspects. Uh, it was for trade, no borders between the trades, you know, common markets, no borders, you know, physical, financial, you see the, the euro took over that as a common currency, uh, so you, you have certain requirements, ISO 9000, International Standards Organization, so if there, any countries want to do any business within the European Union, you have to meet these minimum requirements that you have some kind of quality control, and the U.S., if I want to do business in the European Union, I have to meet those requirements, just like um, uh, European Union when they're selling cars uh, made in the European Union, the U.S. They had to meet our EPA standards, okay? All right, so, you know, they gave up the sovereignty, just like uh, 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 Illinois had to give up its own personal sovereignty. All right, so that's basically, I think that's our uh, that's our whole thing on uh, global business. We're doing introduction to business, so let me just bring this uh, view back down there and uh, close this off real quickly, 100%. So here we go. And so it's an intro to global business. Remember, as a small and medium business, always consider an international aspect of exporting or uh, uh, our, uh, your product, not importing, exporting a product or making a connection. You could do this through some online classes you're taking with me or other individuals you know. Get that export. There's money available. There's training available by the Small Business Administration. That's S ba.gov and you go under you know it's kind of hard to find the site that you know they'd have on there you think to be pushing it but they're not so just go on to search to say global trade and you'll go on information there's a center at uh, I, I know there's a uh, various centers there's one at Harper College there's one at the College of uh, Lake County uh, Harper College I think it's set up at uh, uh, 700 uh, Higgins Road it's at their HBC Center uh, where, where you have some kind of uh, SBA office that could assist you or the work development uh, 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 section, or you could do it at the College of Lake County. I think they have it uh, on the main campus. They have an SBA office in there. And those are two main ones that takes care of Lake County and Cook County. And uh, 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 Wright College in Chicago also has uh, an SBA uh, office within uh, some of their college location. Okay, so that's basically it. Into, uh, intro to global business. Global business, there's no way around it. We're in a flat economy. If our economy is going down, we should be able to sell or buy outside the uh, the United States or we could buy our goods outside the United States as a small and medium business you have to think about that again my name is Dr. George Machaki and I'll see you for our next section have a nice day bye